For the documentary series Researchers and Their Fields, 24 interviews with academics from Tilburg University were recorded. The interviews focused on the choices researchers make. What is high quality research and how do they strive to meet these criteria? To what extent do they engage with practice and theory to ground their work? What inspires and frustrates them? This documentary introduces the interviewee's approach to research. Do they seek to describe or to explain a phenomenon? Are they perhaps interested in making predictions? Do they observe what people actually do? Or do they elicit behavior in an experiment? Is number crunching or discourse analysis their favorite method? Can you describe your research to me? Well, my research focuses on uh, identity formation and personality development. Um, my main interest is identity formation and I take a very broad approach to this. So I used to uh, rely on, uh, on, qu on questionnaire methods. So basically, uh, yeah, uh, not open-ended questionnaires, but uh, really multiple choice uh, responses. So a uh, five point Likert scale. So can you indicate to what extent you feel committed or can you indicate to what uh, extent you are exploring your identity? But uh, yeah, after some, uh, after uh, I felt like why well, I got a little bit dissatisfied with that approach, I now also include the narrative method, uh, and the narrative method is really focused on life stories of individuals, and uh, now I combine the two approaches, and so I can uh, I can uh, combine the more uh, yeah the more seemingly objective uh, questionnaire data with open-ended responses also to illustrate what the numbers that you get from this questionnaire data actually mean. So. And that from that you infer um, identity? Uh, those are aspects of identity indeed. Um, so, so, so basically the idea is uh, that yeah, wh what people pick as their main uh, as the main turning point in their life story uh, is very relevant uh, to researchers for uh, to understanding their identity. And you said earlier that you use this as a complement to um, more quantitative approaches with uh, with yeah. questionnaires. Yeah. How does one build on the other? Um, so they, they tap into different, uh, yeah, different aspects of identity. So uh, the questionnaire approach that we use uh, basically focuses on identity processes. Uh, so uh, one of the processes is commitment. So to what extent you feel uh, yeah, connected to certain life plans that you might have. Uh, for example, your educational choice. And uh, other processes f are more focused on exploration. So these are uh, yeah, the extent to which you thought about different options before you picked one. So uh, like before you picked your major, you might have considered uh, going into medical sciences or economics or whatever. Um, so this process in which you're weighing off different alternatives is referred to exploration. Uh, so that's that's something rather different than what you get with identity narratives because narratives, uh, yeah, in narratives, it's not too too much about commitment or exploration, but it's really about the content of the identity as well. So what is really important to you rather than how you approach your identity? Uh, yeah. Is one more subjective than the other? Uh, well, that's that's arguable. Uh, I would say um, they're equally subjective, but uh, in different ways. Um, so, with a questionnaire method, uh, you decide uh, basically on on yeah what you want uh, participant. Yeah, you decide on what uh, partic uh, participants should find important. With the narrative approach, you give them more of a, yeah, you give them more, so they can decide on what is important and what is not important. However, um, then later on you interpret these stories. So that's where the subjectivity enter, uh, enters a little bit more. Uh, also, you should al also bear in mind, and that's a crit or critique, well, that's a comment that I often get, like, how accurate are these, uh, are these narratives really? Are these really like 
yeah, because we know our memories uh, are not that reliable. So is it really true what these people tell you? Well, uh, so I could say about that that uh, actually it's not about whether it's true or not, but it's really about what a person thinks is true about themselves that is interesting to us as identity researchers. Yeah. Uh, with the questionnaire method, uh, the problem is that different people might interpret the questions uh, differently than what you had in mind. And uh, yeah, they might, uh, they might come up with responses to your questions, but like uh, when one participant answers your question with a five, uh, uh, rates uh, him or herself as five on a five point scale, that might mean something different than with another participant. And yeah, with a, quanti uh, with a, qu a standard quantitative method, you don't really have a lot of control on how, uh, or you don't really get a lot of insight on into how uh, participants uh, interpreted your questions. And uh, yeah, the advantage, at least as how, uh, that's how I see it, of the narrative method is because people write write a response to your uh, to your prompt to your question. You do get a lot of insight into whether uh, participants understood the question the way you meant. Yeah, so I study um, people's belief systems, um, which are well, sometimes people call them worldviews, sometimes people call them ideologies. I don't really care what words people use, but I like to call them belief systems. And that means like, so people's religious beliefs, it could be their political beliefs, um, could be their beliefs about what's right and wrong, their morality. Um, and I try to figure out how these things work what seems to lead people to have different belief systems, people with different belief systems, what kind of effects do those have, how do belief systems work, this sort of thing. And how do you observe belief systems? Um, so there's different ways. Um, the most common way is we basically ask people, um, what are your views on this issue, whether it's a religious issue or a political issue or a moral issue. Um, we kind of ask about a variety of different kind of related issues and see if there's a pattern across those. Um, but we just typically ask people. Um, sometimes we'll do other things um, where we'll try to infer somebody's belief system based on their kind of writings or their behaviors in some other way. So there's some work um, where we actually borrow some work from political scientists who try to figure out where the ideology of politicians based on their votes within a particular uh, legislative body. So we've used techniques from that. Um, there's also people who have done, that we've borrowed work from, um, who try to figure out um, Twitter users' political beliefs based on who they follow um, and the pattern of who they follow and this sort of thing. Um, and we'll use those also to kind of have some inferences, but typically we just ask them. Yeah. And so can imagine that people do not um, easily disclose their uh, information about their beliefs. This is a core. Uh, thing to them. It's related to their identity. Yeah, so um, true. It is. It does seem to be a core thing to, to people, at least to some degree, and uh, some parts of this are tr truly part of their identity. Um, we don't really see evidence that people are holding back, though. Um, people seem to be pretty open about sharing these things. Part of this is that when we do these studies, it's anonymous. We're not collecting, you know, people's uh, BSN numbers. We're not trying to <laughs> Uh, collect their names and addresses mm -hmm. or anything like this. Um, so it's pretty hard to, to link that stuff up. Um, uh, or at least, maybe not impossible, but not straightforward. So I think that gives people some degree of freedom of feeling like they can express these things. It also tends to be stuff that um, if you got somebody, if you sat down with somebody at the right cafe or the right bar, they would share those opinions with you mm -hmm. as well. Um, and um, we found that you know you, if you ask, What's kind of interesting is if you start kind of asking people survey questions and you see a lot of these, you'll find that people are um, relatively high percentages of people will endorse relatively, um, I would say, unusual things. So I don't do this work personally, but I know people who do work on conspiracy theories, some of them that I find pretty outlandish. And you still get anywhere between 5 and 10% of your survey population saying, yep, I believe in this yep. conspiracy theory. So it seems like people are a bit more okay answering these questions than yeah. one might think, yeah. yeah. All right, and then you have information about their belief systems. What do you relate that to? Um, so it kind of depends on the particular study. So sometimes we're trying to figure out why do people hold a particular belief system? 
Um, and so then within kind of my work and the, the field that I work in, we might do things like do surveys and longitudinal studies where we track people over time and look at how maybe people's personality traits or their social status, how those things are associated with their belief systems um, over time or maybe within the same survey. Uh, we might also put people into different experimental conditions. Um, there's a lot of work where you make people feel some degree of, of threat, so remind people about terrorism versus not. See if that affects their political beliefs. Um, and uh, so that's more of an experimental approach. So that's one way we'll do, th do things, try to look at what predicts the, the belief systems or try to figure that out. Another thing we'll do is we'll take the belief systems and try to figure out like what's coming out of this. And so this can be a lot of different things. So some of this is um, so environmentally uh, environmental friendly behavior, um, such as you know recycling or other kinds of changes that are made in your life to improve the environment. You might look at things like um, prejudice. Um, so this is kind of this dislike of groups or people or individuals based on their groups they belong to and try to look at how different belief systems seem to inspire different kinds of prejudices um, and try to really kind of map out both what seems to be causing these things and also what seems to be kind of on the output side of these. And how do you then try to establish causality? Um, well, I don't really promise to establish causality. Uh, I try to avoid that because because it is so difficult but I try to uh, think about it in uh, yeah in a different way saying okay um, in what context do these laws come up and uh, what do they achieve uh, do they have uh, well a certain influence in public debate etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. is the purpose of your research more generally to explain um, I think um, the explanation questions, so to say, are questions that really appeal to me. Um, uh, it, it, that's, uh, I, I think it has to do with wanting to look further than just what is the law. Um, and I want to know why, I want to know uh, yeah, what role law plays in society. So yes, I do really like explan explanatory questions in my research. Yeah. You, s you say that they appeal to you. Is it, is it an uncommon approach? In your field? Uh, it's not uncommon, but it's not the only approach, certainly. Uh, I think in the, in the field of legal studies, uh, you will encounter a variety of approaches to research and also a variety of opinions on what is good research, uh, which makes it quite challenging also to, um, well, to deal with that and to come to a common idea of what is good research, uh, because traditionally uh, legal studies were um, often concerned with more dogmatic research, normative research, um, for instance, uh, to look at a certain legal principle, uh, say legal certainty, and then you would look at particular laws, particular case law, uh, and to test uh, whether what happens in practice in case law, in legislation, actually conforms to these higher principles. Uh, that's an example of how you could do this dogmatic research. Uh, that's also something I do sometimes, but not only that. Um, so that's one approach you could take as a legal scholar. Um, it's also um, uh, the case that, um, especially in my field, criminal law, we've had quite some influence from uh, a field like criminology, uh, which is more uh, towards the field of uh, social science, but also broader. Uh, also, um, geoscience plays a role there, and all kinds of other, uh, all kinds of societies, as long as it deals with crime. And uh, to my mind, and I think many uh, criminal lawyers would agree with that, um, if you want to uh, do research in the field of criminal law, it's very important to take this kind of research into account, this criminology, uh, criminological research. So you study the relationship between citizens and, um, um, and governments. Yes. How do you go about that research? Um, well, first of all, um, in, 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 in law, uh, we often conduct a legal analysis. Uh, and when you conduct a legal analysis, you always start with the primary source of information, which is in our case uh, law, law and regulation. 
Uh, so we look and read the law and regulation. Um, and additionally, we look at the preparatory documents, uh, for example, the discussions in Parliament uh, and how they um, adopted a certain rule and what the reasons are behind uh, these uh, rules and regulations. And then secondly, uh, because laws are often very vague, very open norms, um, secondly, we look at jurisprudence, at case law, um, how courts um, apply the general broad laws to specific uh, cases between individuals or between public actors uh, and individuals. And then thirdly, we look at all the doctrine, all the articles and books that are written uh, on this uh, subject. Um, and that's mainly a descriptive uh, analysis. Um, and then secondly, we always try to develop normative conclusions, often. Um, and these normative conclusions are often uh, what the law should be. So the first part, the descriptive part, is actually what the law is right now, the law, but also the reasons behind the law and the law as applied by judges. Um, and then secondly, we try to develop reform proposals of how we can adopt uh, the law and make the law better uh, and also the judgments of the courts. Uh, so in order to improve uh, the law, the regulation and the case law in order to, uh, in order to come to a better uh, society in the end. The, the first part, the descriptive mm -hmm. research, sounds um, interpretive to me. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think it's a fair assessment. Um, I think often we, we conduct uh, the descriptive analysis, um, often without reflecting on it uh, too much. Uh, but increasingly there is more and more attention to the methodology um, of how you do this. Um, and increasingly we are also um, arguing um, how we conducted our descriptive analysis. And I think this is increasingly important. For example, when you uh, conduct research on uh, the doctrine, um, uh, one way uh, to handle this is to read around uh, and to take one of the main articles, look at all the footnotes um, and the references to other literature, and then in the end uh, you should have a good overview of all the literature um, on this particular uh, topic. Uh, but increasingly uh, it becomes more and more difficult uh, to conduct this analysis because you don't only have to look at the Netherlands, um, but there's also a very uh, increasing impact of the EU level and the international global level. Um, so the um, the cornerstones of your research are not only national but also supra and international, which makes it tougher uh, to give a good descriptive analysis um, and to analyze um, all the particular aspects that are uh, necessary uh, to address uh, your main research question. Uh, my research it's, it fits in the field of comparative political behavior. So I'm interested in the, in the, in the, in the behavior of, of political parties, of party systems, of voters. Also, I focus on individual parliamentarians um, uh, and always in a comparative perspective. So I focus on multiple parties, multiple party systems, um, multiple countries. Uh, so, yeah, my research is comparative. And also, while not a whole field of uh, comparative political behavior is quantitative, but my, my research really f uh, fits in a quantitative tradition. And how do you observe um, party behavior? Uh, party behavior, well, I, uh, I collect a lot of data on political parties. So if I, for instance, if I study why, why, why parties change their platform, their political positions, I rely on a very large database uh, from the Second World War onwards that has uh, coded all the party manifestos. So then on each, each, on all the different issues, you can see what issues do parties emphasize during a com campaign. Did they change their position between campaigns? So based on, the, well, a lot of data. And how is that uh, behavioral? Uh, for instance, party behavior. Why does a party uh, change, uh, change position? Why do mm -hmm. new political parties enter? Uh, why do voters vote for uh, for uh, right wing populist parties? Uh, oh, it's yeah. Well, are you, so it's not necessary uh, not to avoid confusion. It's not necessary uh, not necessarily a, a behavioral pers perspective. So you were referring probably yeah. to behavioral economics, right? Mm -hmm. There are some people that uh, well that apply behavioral economics to party behavior, but of course that's that's a subgroup. Yeah. yeah. And your um, your analysis of uh, is of the industry of the of the group of um, um, uh, of parties. Yeah, my research line on the on the entry of new parties and the exit of parties. I study at the national level why do why do they enter national party systems? Why do they exit from the national party systems? Okay. And what kind of analyses do you use? 
Uh, well, uh, regression methods, like uh, logistical regression. Mm -hmm. yeah. And these are um, inspired by an ecological perspective? Uh, well, not all my research is on organizational ecology, but uh, well, well, my research on, uh, on party entry and exit, yeah, that's uh, really, really built on the organizational, traditional, uh, tr uh, organizational ecological tradition. And can you explain what that tradition is like? Well, that what the tradition is like, uh, well, it, uh, it emerged from the field of organizational sociology. And the idea is that organizations like animals in the ecosystem, organizations also, while well, they compete for the same resources, for the same scarce resources, for instance, a newspaper, they all compete for, uh, well, for advertisers, they compete for readers, and, uh, uh, and also, well, for beer breweries, for instance, they also compete with other bre uh, breweries and they, com they compete for customers. Uh, and well, uh, this perspective, it hasn't, uh, well, it, has hard, it hasn't hardly been uh, uh, translated to parties, but you could also say parties within a party system, they compete with one another, they compete for the same voters, they compete for activists, they compete for, for, for donors. So uh, 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 and the message of organizational ecology is the environment, so it's, it's really important to understand why new parties enter and why existing parties exit. Uh, so my uh, research is uh, predominantly in the area of uh, organizational ecology. And uh, what uh, ecologists uh, do is uh, uh, basically to, to study uh, industries, populations of organizations for uh, uh, sometimes extremely long period of time. Uh, sometimes for 10, 15 years, sometimes for 50 years, uh, sometimes even for uh, 200 years. Uh, and ecologists are uh, by and large interested in how these populations evolve over time and how they change uh, as a result of uh, the entry of new companies and the exit of uh, old companies. Uh, and so organizational ecology is um, inspired by uh, models from uh, bioecology. Uh, it may sound strange to apply biological models to, uh, to, to companies, uh, but uh, yeah, some of the underlying mathematical foundations of these models seem to apply very well to uh, companies as well, uh, because also in populations of companies, we see that uh, the entities, companies in this case, compete for limited resources. Uh, and there's a sort of a carrying capacity of uh, the environment in which they operate, the market. Uh, and yeah, within this environment, they have to find a way to survive. Uh, and not all of these companies uh, survive. Uh, some of these companies fail and uh, they are removed from the market. So in many ways, uh, e ecological models, as they are common in, in, in biology, can also be very useful to understand uh, the ecological dynamics uh, of, uh, of companies. Uh, yeah. So in that sense, a, an organization is a, is a species, like a, like a human being? Uh, well, not in exactly the, the same way, uh, but um, uh, there are species in the sense that, uh, yeah, there are a cluster of, uh, of, of organizations that share similar features uh, that share a certain uh, organizational form, that share an identity, uh, and they happen to be uh, subject to the same dynamics uh, of entry and exit in the same way that uh, organisms are sub subject to uh, birth and, and death. Uh, and uh, so the mathematical models uh, uh, can explain much of the same dynamics. Uh. So your, your idea is that you can capture dynamics in an industry by modeling the behavior of organizations. Yes, so, so ecologists believe that um, uh, yeah, even though individual organizations can, can change, uh, most of the change in the industries that we see uh, occurs through the selective replacement of uh, individual organizations. So, uh, the entry of new companies and the exit of old ones. That's how most industries uh, 
uh, evolve over time, how they, how they change over time. Um, uh, and, 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 and to a lesser extent, it, it happens through individual organizations changing. Are mm. there also drawbacks? Is there a limit to what these models can do? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, uh, yeah, parsimonious models come at the expense of uh, uh, detail. Um, and uh, yeah, so with ecology, what turns out to be especially challenging is to get data at the firm level, uh, because we rely on archival data, sometimes dating back uh, 100 or 150 years. Uh, and so if we really want to understand, for instance, organizational change uh, and understand reorganizations that what we just talked about, then it sometimes can be quite hard to get that data uh, from a company that existed uh, 100 years ago, uh, because we don't know in some cases, we do know when a certain or reorganization happened, but we don't know the internal dynamics. We don't know which employees resisted to the organizational change. We don't know uh, how long the reorganization uh, lasted uh, and uh, whether training was offered to employees, uh, whether employees were coached. And uh, so, uh, yeah, much of the dynamics internal to the organization is still... Uh, 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 pretty much a black box uh, to, to ecologists because yeah, the level of analysis is mostly at the, the population level. Now you said that you're interested in the in the why question. Mm -hmm. um, so why do parties uh, parties enter? Um, your approach is a, is a quality is a quantitative yeah. one. Um, do you also consider qualitative approaches to address such questions? Uh, I don't re uh, really do qu uh, qualitative research, but I'm. Uh, but I think in my uh, 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 in, in this research line, I think it could be highly relevant to learn more about the causal mechanisms. So, what I would also like to do in the future is not only well to observe empirical patterns on a large number uh, uh, of cases, but I would also like to talk to uh, uh, to entrants, so to to people who start new parties, and just to ask them, well, wh why? Why did you start this party? No. It would be highly relevant to yeah. understand the um, yeah. the motives for yeah. establishing parties. Because now I do have different uh, explanations for the behavior that I observe, but it, I didn't talk to real people, so it would be highly relevant. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you you observe yeah. behavior without observing. Um, uh, people who uh, behaving. I theorize on the causal mechanism, but I don't uh, uh, observe the causal mechanism. No. No. Um, I'm a computational linguist by training. Uh, the field of computational linguistics in general uh, involves building computational tools and techniques for dealing with language data. This can be both for uh, investigating scientific questions or also applying to real life applications. Um, but personally, I have always been also interested in cognitive science, so how humans learn to use language, uh, both as children as, and as an adult. So I've been basically trying to bridge these two fields of study by building models that simulate the processing and learning of language in children and adults. And in computational Linguistics, the linguistics refers to learning the language. What is a computational model? Uh, well, first of all, linguistics doesn't only r refer to the learning of language, but also to the whole, you know, formalization of language as a communication system and also how it's being processed. So it could also refer to uh, systems that have the linguistic knowledge already embedded and then focus on the processing aspects of it. Um, the computational uh, part basically involves building very explicit processes for dealing with data. Uh, that can be done through very detailed mathematical uh, systems or, as is more familiar to us these days, by, by building computer programs or computer systems that receive data and process it and generate some sort of an output. These computers also use kind of detailed 
algorithm. So what's, what's the difference between a, a mathematical model and a computer-based model? A mathematical model does not have to be implemented in the form of a computer program, right? So a computer program usually needs some sort of, as you said, an algorithm um, or some detailed process uh, that is then translated via a computer programming language to uh, an executable module on a software platform. Um, a mathematical model typically is just a very formalized, precise definition of a, a process. Um, so that's, it could be more specified than a computer program, but it doesn't necessarily have to be implemented in the form of a computer program. And what is the purpose done to predict um, language acquisition, for example? So that depends on the research question that you're pursuing. Um, in my research, I've been interested in how different aspects of language uh, are learned from the data that's available to children or to humans, I should say, in general. Um, language acquisition is a very complex process because language is a complex system and it has many different facets from the sound system to the representation of meaning and everything that's in between. In addition, there is a lot of you know, interaction aspects because humans don't use, use typically language in isolation. They use it to communicate with other humans. So social aspects also play a role. Um, so when you do research in this field, you basically have to focus on a particular aspect. So you have to simplify the problem in some way. Um, but that's basically the underlying goal of most of the research programs within this field, that uh, the idea is that you use computational models as a, as a methodology for investigating what kinds of mechanisms and what kinds of representational frameworks are more cognitively plausible and have more exploratory and explanatory power when describing human behavior when they learn and use language. Would, would that then involve an, an assumption that, that humans are machines as well and we only need to discover their algorithms? Uh, I want you to elaborate on that. So what would be the alternative assumption? <laughs> um, so we, we assume humans are machines as opposed to what? As opposed to um, um, people with, with consciousness, with, uh, with intuition perhaps? So do you see consciousness and intuition as some extra modules to simple data processing. So you see consciousness as something that's outside of the human brain. If you can think of human brain as a, as a data processing system. Well, one could argue that, um, that intuition, um, or, but which I think is in a way the opposite of, uh, of consciousness, um, is decision making without you being aware of how mm -hmm. you came to a decision. I see. So um, um, certainly there are, cer cer um, I would say, conscious and unconscious aspects to using language and learning language. Um, I think a prime example of that would be learning the first language as opposed to learning the second language when you, um, as a child, learn language just by being exposed to it as opposed to actually trying to learn a language as an adult by reading books and doing exercises. So certainly there is a, a this kind of distinction between different mechanisms. Um, when you try to build a system from scratch, um, intuition is usually seen within computational um, framework of doing research on language as certain biases that are incorporated in your system before being exposed to data from outside. And then also in a computational model, you need to include biases that people... Yeah, certainly. People that, that, that's actually what I was referring to, that uh, this is an important part of building a model to identify assumptions and biases that exist in humans and then incorporate them into your computational model and then test it by comparing the behavior of the model to the behavior of language learners, human language learners. My research is discovering the function of the brain and specifically perception. Uh, and specifically for perception is we want to know how 
auditory stimuli and visual stimuli are combined in the brain. So that's called multisensory perception. And we have different senses, uh, for example, touch, hearing, vision. And we want to know how the senses are combined in the brain, where and when. And especially the when part, that's my topic. So what I do is I devise experiments on the computer and I want to test and to discover when the different senses are combined, are integrated in a whole part. But what I do, so what I do is I make an experiment, I, I uh, change the situation or the tasks, the surrounding, and I predict that you will behave like this and you will behave like that in a different condition, a different situation. I measure uh, the behavior, I can measure the behavior with just reaction times or whatever, but also at the level of the brain. And I can relate the brain activity to what I, um, what I, uh, with, with the experimental factors. And that tells me about whether how the brain works or whether there's a, some dysfunction. Now you say that you want to learn how the brain works. Of course. Um, and you do that by studying specific brains. Of course. Um, so how do you get to the more abstract level of knowing how the brain works? Is a brain is a brain is a brain? Um, well, the brain. So, so we have individual differences. I'm not sure whether you are want going to talk about that, but um, the brain is the brain for us. So if I pick your brain or my brain or someone else's brain, we get a bit different results uh, because they vary. That's why we use a lot of, not a lot of, but a, a couple of uh, participants. And there is variance and uh, between the subjects. Uh, and that's inherent to individual differences. And sometimes we can explain those variants and sometimes we don't explain those variants and we call it error. So there's always error in your, uh, in your data. Uh, and the idea is that the error should be low enough uh, to say something about the function of the brain. But what we do is we cannot say, okay, I can exactly know how your brain works. No, it's on group level. So we cannot say specific things about your brain, but we say things in general. What I hate is that people do something different <laughs> and their brains look a bit different. I want them to be the same because, you know, um, the brain in, uh, I don't know, in Italy should be the same as the brain in Canada. It's the same, it's the same brain basically. Of course, there are differences uh, maybe in culture, uh, but also differences in uh, raising um, uh, and education. But our processes are so fundamental and low level because it's, it's the basic vision. We think that it shouldn't matter who is in our uh, lab. Eventually, they should have the same output. So models are still a, a big uh, benchmark in economics. So, so from models, you start with models, compared maybe to psychology, you start with modeling, and from these models we derive predictions, and these predictions then we bring to the lab or to other data to test, and then based we can test whether the models actually describe accurately behavior, and if not, we can see how these models should be adjusted. Yeah. So models are very prominent, I would say, in economics. Yeah. And, and then you enter the lab. What does, what does that look like? What's, what does an experimental research look like? An experimental research. So the subjects enter the lab. Um, they get randomly assigned to cubicles, to computers. So we do it here in the center lab, for example, where we have many of those computers. Uh, they uh, make decisions. Can be any, we can replicate markets. But in my case, as I said, I typically do uh, research into individual decision making. So in my case, mostly they uh, 
are not connected with other subjects, so they make individual decisions, can be choice between lotteries or any choice I'm interested in. <laughs> and then an important aspect is, I think, uh, that they're incentivized, right? So that's very important into uh, experimental economics and uh, an important facet, because the idea is that uh, economic theory makes predictions about how people choose when or adjust their behavior when incentive structures change, right? So think of uh, unemployment benefits, right? When they go up, people are going to supply less labor because they're less willing to work. So they respond to incentives. So therefore, the idea of experimental economics is that in the lab, people should also have incentives because the theory makes predictions about environments where incentives are very important, right? And so it's no use, basically, to test these theories in environments where they don't apply, so in environments without incentives. So that's why experimental economists are very stringent on, on incentives. So I design really controlled interactions where I can look at how specific features of an interaction influence trust between people. So for example, I can conduct an experiment where I bring participants into the lab and have them interact with a person who looks similar to them or looks dissimilar to them, a man or a woman, a person of the same nationality or a different nationality. When we do these laboratory experiments, we have total control over the situation participants experience. So this is a, a good question. And Psychologists, they totally agree with economists that the experiment has to be engaging. So psychologists agree that they want participants to be paying attention and taking things seriously. But the psychologist solution to the problem is that they say, it isn't about the money or it isn't about giving consequences, economic consequences, we want things to be psychologically realistic or psychologically engaging for participants. So we want them to, uh, you know, feel, to be in a situation where they feel as if their, their tasks or their choices are really important. And a lot of the times, the sort of social features of a situation so knowing that you might hurt another person's feelings or that another person might hurt your feelings, these, these consequences are just as real to participants as the monetary consequences economists care about. My, my focus is on digital culture. So the ways in which new technologies and the use of digital media shape and influence our culture. And you study these, um, these digital cultures with the ethnographic method? Yes. So as an ethnographer, I observe the kinds of things that people do online or the way in which they use technologies in their everyday lives. Um, for example, my recent research is about conspiracy theories online and how they spread and circulate in online environments. And the interest uh, that I have in that is, of course, the broader question of misinformation, which is a huge topic nowadays. Um, and how do people pick up and come to believe all kinds of things which, for instance, would go against scientific evidence. And there, uh, so if you look at the influence of digital technologies, it's the shape of our social media, for example, that maybe um, has some kind of an influence on how these beliefs spread and what is it that makes people pick them up. And how do you go about studying these, these, on these online interactions? Ethnography um, basically relies uh, on observation. So that's one staple uh, feature of ethnography always, but then it's methodologically flexible. So depending on the kind of case that you have at hand, you can combine different methods. So observation is, is always there. Then depending on the, uh, the type of study that you're doing, you can uh, do focus groups or interviews, surveys. So also you can combine qualitative and quantitative methods. What I'm doing now is, is a form of discourse analysis, so trying to understand the strategies uh, that people have uh, in trying to convince others that the, the theories that they have are uh, valid and credible. And what do you observe then in these, these online communities? What so what's your unit of, what, what's your data, what does it look like? My data looks like uh, interactions, so 
uh, I combine uh, ethnography with discourse analysis. So what I observe is um, what do people say, how do they say it, for instance patterns in how they uh, construct their arguments, what kinds of evidence they draw in. Um, uh, there are things like intertextuality are very important. So in practice looking at the, uh, the kinds of texts that people draw on and cite as evidence for their views. So it's different discursive strategies that people make use of. And these can be either verbal, so written, um, or uh, visual. So data is actually a very diverse thing in, in ethnography, in discourse analysis. The discourse analysis aspect is then the um, analyzing the arguments. Yes, for instance, that can be one uh, aspect. Uh, another aspect could be uh, looking at the uh, different types uh, of discursive strategies that people use. So for instance, combinations of visual material and written material. And why is it important to have such varied um, data sources? Well, for ethnographers it's important to have varied data sources uh, because the way in which people make meaning is actually a very varied exercise. So we don't only use one m mean and method of communication. And especially in online environments, you see that this is the case, that it's very multimodal, meaning that people combine audio, video, written material, images, all kinds of things. And all of this has to be taken into account to give a full picture of what it is that people do. So the idea is more to discover and, and uh, elements and aspects of reality and uh, interpret the realities that people have and do less hypothesis testing. This doesn't mean that we don't have hypotheses uh, when we start out with research because the research question has to come from somewhere. But there has to be a willingness also to uh, reflect on those hypotheses depending on what arises from the field that you study. It seems that this type of research is highly context dependent. Exactly, it is indeed highly context dependent, but that really um, can be explained with the idea that ethnographers have about uh, human culture and societies. Uh, human behavior is very context dependent. And that's why ethnographers uh, really think that it makes sense to study uh, human behavior in the context in which it occurs because that's how human life is. It's really shaped by the context in which we find ourselves. Mm -hmm.